find the previous three industrial revolutions, but a new one, luminous. The latest transformation is powered by a whole range of exponential technologies uh, that have the potential to change the world as we know it. It's the fourth industrial revolution, and it's uh, set to fundamentally shift the way that we work and the way that we play. And most importantly, it will shift the way that our world shares access to essential services. Technology is a great system It can level social planes and economic barriers more efficiently than any other resources known to mankind thus far. And today, the GSMA says that 65% of the world's population has a mobile subscription, and that's due to rise to about 73 by the year 2020. And nowhere is this more true than in Africa, which is not just the mobile first continent, it is a mobile only ecosystem. Nine out of 10 new subscribers over the next four years will come from countries in Africa. Today, Africa's technology is not only handheld, it's uh, helping to find new ways to create more inclusive economies and communities. Across the continent, a growing number of tech companies and entrepreneurs are finding gaps in their markets and plugging them with simple tech solutions. The continent is undergoing a massive digital transformation. And every industry is digitizing, from banking to agriculture, uh, right to the center are technologies, technology developers such as these young people today. McKinsey estimates that the widespread use of digital finance will boost the annual GDP of emerging economies by $3.7 trillion by 2025. And today, more than 40% of the adult population in seven countries, in Kenya, in Gabon, in Ghana, in Tanzania, Uganda, and Zimbabwe, use mobile money regularly, with many gaining access to finance for the very first time using their mobile phones. Mobile-based pay-as-you-go solar is providing access to clean energy solutions with entrepreneurs partnering with mobile operators to deliver solutions. Nearly 40,000 systems are going live across the world every month. There are now 4.8 million homes in Africa which now access power only through the use of mobile technologies. With me today are Oscar and Juliana. Oscar is using the mobile phone to redistribute food to the less privileged community, whilst Juliana is a co-founder of Ushahidi, using the power of mobile connections that she and her partners created uh, to be one of the world's first crowdsourced information services. So let me just turn to you. And uh, let me start with you, Oscar. Yeah. To what degree is that reality, and to what degree is it overhyped? Well, it's, it's, a very, um, it's very real in that um, across the African continent, young entrepreneurs like myself and my colleagues are actually um, self-initiating projects that are addressing real issues, right? Like you mentioned, some of the things we're doing with technology, um, we're able to empower households um, who are like underserved and low-income earners uh, and are food deprived and facing food poverty from products that are actually approaching the end of shelf life, which we are able to aggregate from retail shops who otherwise would have wasted them. And I can give you several examples, um, including a friend of mine, he's Ugandan, and he uses a mobile payment system to empower smallholder farmers in rural Uganda um, to increase their level of income uh, and also standardize their processes uh, and give them access to market and overall uh, raise their income levels and, and get them out of poverty. Um, so there is indeed you know, the, the risk of it being overhyped, but um, on the ground, uh, real solutions are being achieved and are being tested uh, 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 across the board, across Africa. Juliana, despite your youthful good looks, you've been in this space <laughs> for a while. Um, hype or reality? I think it's definitely reality, um, particularly when we look at the sort of impact that um, the mobile revolution has had on people's lives. Um, M-Pesa, um, the mobile money transfer system that 
pioneered this idea of sending money to someone miles away uh, has been really transformative, uh, not only to the Kenyan economy, but also to people's lives and has made things more efficient. Um, and uh, if you talk to a vendor on the side of the road who uh, is an M-Pesa agent where they can pro they're actually earning money. So there, there's impact in terms of recipients, but then I think there's also impact in terms of supporting entrepreneurs. So it's definitely a reality from the bottom. Uh, if you look at it from on the ground, um, it is definitely a reality. So if it's a reality, Oscar, what, what do we need to do to enhance this ecosystem? Because you're working in Nigeria, and you know we had some really interesting conversations earlier, uh, but it's still a fairly small thing. How can we grow this ecosystem? Um, I believe the, the, the democratization of resources, um, making those resources, when I say resources, I'm talking about funding, um, the right kinds of markets, the right kinds of partnerships. Um, because sometimes it does tend to be something only accessible to certain kinds of people. Um, for, in, for example, in my country, most of the successful businesses are people who studied abroad, for example, and have those right networks. Um, but the average African, for example, is just a young guy whose uh, cousins or aunt is just a, a small holder farmer or a market woman, for example. Um, and that's the kind of, pro that's the way I grew up. And it's important also, that's one point, democratization of resources, making it possible for everyone to access the right kind of resources. The second point is that um, the people, um, the, the, the companies and partnerships that are necessary to make this uh, become a reality um, should also key in and, and leverage um, those skills and talent that's available uh, within the ecosystem. Juliana, do you think there's more that can be done between the private sector and the public sector? Because everything you talked about, Oscar, okay. is about how does the, the private sector uh, and the Absolutely. NGOs work. Do you think there's more that could be done? And, and how do we go about doing that? I really think that there is, uh, actually it's the frontier um, for extending the uh, technology renaissance. Uh, when we have public and private uh, partnerships. An example is, um, as a board member of DIAL, some of the, the Digital Impact Alliance have seen some of the examples of work that they're doing in Tanzania, where they are partnering with PATH. And the idea there is that the government will get an idea, um, a view as to how um, epidemics could possibly be uh, happening um, changes in migration patterns, um, ability to forecast. So um, we cannot do it alone, um, whether let me, private let me, let me sector or public, for a second and public sector. You there. Yeah. Let me challenge you there, because the Ebola crisis we had a couple of years ago, um, we didn't use data. You know, governments and private sector didn't come to the rescue. And, and surely, you know, with what you've done with crowdsourcing and Ushahidi, which has been used across the world, uh, surely, more could have been done by using technology to address that problem. I think the Ebola crisis really exposed a lot of uh, missed opportunities. One was the missed opportunity of funding healthcare, because as a percentage of GDP, funding healthcare systems in African countries was is dismal. So that's problem number one. Um, that's even before we talk about how to. To, to, have better, better, to have better health systems um, in various countries and getting information from the ground up so that you have better forecasting by, digit, um, by medical officers. So uh, I agree with you that that was a missed opportunity, but it also exposed the vulnerabilities um, that various African countries, particularly the ones that were hit by Ebola, and actually also showed us that we can use crowdsourcing platforms, we can use um, better forecasting systems and do better uh, when the next epidemic hits. Oscar, um, you might just want to share just very briefly what your solution does, but you, you hate it being, being called an app. Okay. Just, just for a couple of seconds. Okay, so um, what Chowberry is, Chowberry is a constituent of technologies. Um, it's a web-based software that does two things primarily. On one hand, we help reduce food waste at the retail and consumption site with this application. And on the other hand, we facilitate the redistribution of those products 
that would have otherwise gone to waste to underserved communities, people who are facing food poverty. And I like to use you know, real life context. So let's say Bob, for example, is a retail owner. So we give him this app, sign him up on that application, and he's able to use the application to track and monitor products that are approaching the end of shelf life, about 90 days to its expiration. And then the same data that he's aggregating in terms of products shelf life, we're able to extract that and present it as deep discounts. And we have NGOs, charities, and other organizations who are already undergoing feeding programs in local communities. They can then leverage those deep discounts uh, for their feeding program. So if they were to spend $100 to feed 20 people, they can then spend as low as $50 to feed 50 people. And I just wanted to add one last point concerning uh, in terms of strengthening the ecosystem. Um, in Africa, it's very important that we contextualize our ecosystem to our environment. I mean, coming up as an entrepreneur, I read several books you know, on lean startup and all that. So they said, if you want to go into market first, uh, raise finances from family and friends. But in Africa, who's your family and friend that can give you $5,000? My aunt used to sell in the marketplace. She doesn't have $5,000 to give to me. And then you talk to a VC or an investor and he says, you know, you have 10 things to bring, you have to get this, you have to get audited accounts. Yeah. I don't know all that. I'm just a guy who has this solution and wants to present it and wants to solve a, a real life problem with what I have. So it's important to contextualize our local environment and not try to copy, you know, all the time. So that's, that's absolutely so important. Let me ask you both uh, a question. Um, because when I listen to your, to your solution, that's a solution to a problem which is all over the world. You know, the world actually produces as much food as it needs. It's just not in the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, and even here in the, on the Upper East Side, you know, there's a lot of food that's wasted. So why can't that, what do we need to do to make that kind of solution relevant in other markets, not just in developing markets? I know my son, who's just finished university, he would be more than happy to use that app <laughs> to find cheap food, which is uh, running to close to its sell by date. Yeah, well. Even me sometimes might <laughs> do that. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's a real solution. Like, um, the problems in Africa are very strong. So if it's a perfect testing ground for some of these kind of problems. And if it's taken anywhere else in the world, we need just the right kind of partnerships, um, the right kind of uh, investors, the right kind of people that can really replicate some of these solutions. And it is you know, a great solution that can work, like you said, anywhere in the world. Yeah. Julia? Um, I think it points to the issue of how do we scale um, entrepreneurship yeah. uh, from Africa, either from Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, or wherever, and making sure that we make those connections mm -hmm. between your son in the UK and uh, people in the Upper East Side or West Side, yeah. um, two solutions that can actually help to make a difference in our world. Uh, mm -hmm. So how do we scale social good entrepreneurs um, and that not only is it partnership but then it's also looking at the sustainability model from the very beginning to make sure that there is a path to scale mm. um, and different funding mechanisms but i really think we need to connect markets um, be it from america to uh, africa we need to do more integration Okay, last couple of questions. One is how do we ensure that this becomes much more inclusive for girls and women on the continent? And, and the, the final question is, um, you know, do you think that these inclusive solutions will eradicate the need for foreign aid? So I think in order to have inclu uh, to include women and girls, I think what we need to look at is from a foundational perspective, when we're creating companies, uh, when we're hiring executives in the C-level, or um, from a foundational perspective, we need to be including women. Uh, from uh, board level, uh, all those, just look at it as the base foundation of um, whichever work that you're uh, involved in, it's important to really include women. That would be number one. Number two is to look at the pipeline of talent there are incredible women that are part of the technology story and have been uh, for a while. What we need to do is to make sure that more and more women are getting into technology and also getting into entrepreneurship and that they have the support to be able to do that through mentorship, 
um, through financing uh, and opening the doors for them to thrive because they will and they've, they've shown that they can thrive. Okay, so we ran out of time. Um, sorry, we didn't get to answer that final question. I want to thank you very much, Oscar. Thank you very much, uh, Juliana. You've actually, you are in, indeed one of those role models of the, of the young women who are making a huge difference in Africa. And Oscar, like every Nigerian, you know, you're showing us the way to go. Thank so you. thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.